As we get into the next half of the class, we're going to be talking about what caused Paul to write so much. Um, and let me just ask you guys, as you read the, the books of the New Testament and Paul's writings, what are some things that you guys find that sticks out to you that uh, are issues within the church? All right, let's do it this way. Let's have a little fun. Okay, don't name your church, but what are some issues that you have in your own church? Okay, Christians acting unchristianly, okay, and arguing about stuff. What are some things that happen in your own church that you're like, are you guys serious? Oh, everybody's smiling, but no one wants to say anything. <laughs> Well, inside the church, you, you overhear a lot of things as people are commenting on others, which yeah, is inside of church, and the gossip is just... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, people leaving the church because they, you know, they got mad with the pastor, with the, something that the pastor said. Yeah, people leaving the church because of something that was said, yeah. That's another one. Have you guys ever had people get upset over a particular song or style of music? That happens. Yes. Um, I know for us, we have some people that's in leadership that doesn't lead with love. Mm. Not leading with love. That's a good one. So... Does everybody in your church get along? Probably not, right? Uh, you know, I've heard churches that they have uh, one person sit on one side of the sanctuary while another person sits on the other side of the sanctuary because they don't want to come in contact with that individual. Um, there's churches, and I, I really heard that this was a, a legitimate thing, that a... Um, one of the founding donors donated a toilet to the to the church when they really needed it, and it broke. That toilet broke. So rather than taking out and replacing it, they left it in the bathroom and put a plaque on it because they didn't want to upset anybody. And it kind of sounds like a uh, an idol to me, doesn't it? So. I think every church has their issues, and every generation of church has their issues. And I think if Paul was still alive today, the church in Miami, the church in Idaho, the church in Detroit, you know, the church in the middle of Cartagena, Colombia, would be getting a letter from him letting us know that we're not getting it quite right, right? Because um, as long as we're arguing inside the church, we're not doing our job which is to be reaching people on the outside of the church. And that's really the crux of what Paul gets to. And we all know it. That's why we all get kind of giggled and smiled when I said we don't have any issues within our church, right? So here's just a quick um, look. And I like this because it's a really good chart that lets us know some of the things that... Um, we're affecting the church in that day. Uh, this is a really cool chart. Uh, Galatians uh, is, you know, they, they were having issues going towards the law, right? And you see that within that. Uh, you see it in uh, the different issues that were, were affecting the, the church in Thessaloniki the, or the Thessalonians. Uh, that they thought they were being told that Jesus had already returned and he had already established their kingdom and that the church in Thessalonica missed out on it. And so the Christians in Thessalonica, they were very worried that they had missed the rapture 
and they had missed the kingdom of God returning. And so Paul had to write to them and discuss that. And he was like, hey, listen, I already talked to you guys about how that's going to take place, right? So you see each one of the different ones represented there and how it affects the church. The church has never been, even though Jesus sees us as perfect, there's no perfect church, even from the beginning. It's always been full of holes. It's always been full of issues. Uh, there, there was uh, ladies that fought against each other, um, men that took advantage of their positions, um, people arguing over, you know, how things should be done. And that's even as early as when the church first took place, right? Uh, in the book of Acts, it says when the first church first was established, that uh, as we discussed a couple weeks ago, that the Gentile, uh, not Gentile, excuse me, the Greek Jews, the Hellenistic Jews, the, the widows, were being overlooked when it came to distribution of food. And so they were, they were you know, it, it was just because people didn't look at them in the same light that they looked at the Hebrew Jews, right? So all of that is, you know, issues. Is When you have people, people are going to be people because we have a fallen nature, we're going to uh, come to church warts and all. But as Jesus said, it's not the people that think that they're holy that need needed a doctor, right? It's not the people that think that they're not sick that uh, look, you know, look at themselves in life and say, hey, look, I'm doing really good. I don't need any help. Uh, Jesus says that he came to the person that needed the, the most help. And that's why he was accused and Matthew chapter 11 of being the friend of tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners, right? It's because those are the people that embraced him and said, oh, yeah, I really need a savior. Not the Pharisees. And so that's why there's issues within church. But it's up to believers that as we are confronted with the issues that are in church, to rectify, to change, to go to the scripture and see how we can make those changes for the best. Because the word of God is our source of truth. And so if we see any of these things that are listed in the church and Paul is writing about and saying, hey, listen, you, you really should change that. It, it shouldn't be that way. We should make that change. We should go ahead and change that about ourselves. Uh, as Jesus says, the, the area we should start with is us, right? We shouldn't take the plank out of our, uh, the, the speck out of our brother's eye when we have a plank sitting in our own. So we always have to look at ourselves, too, and say, am I showing the same amount of love? Am I loving God? Am I loving people? Right? So the book, first book that we're going to look at is the book of Galatians. Okay, in the book of Galatians, um, Paul had planted some churches south in Galatia. And uh, there was Judaizers, or people that... Uh, still, even though they had already trusted Christ, um, they still believed that you had to obey the law. And so they were coming to the churches in Galatia and saying, hey, you guys need to be circumcised. You need to eat like us. You guys need to observe the law like us in order to truly be Christians. And so Paul is writing to the church in Galatia and trying to fix this problem because this is an obvious problem. They had trusted Christ as their Savior. They had trusted his complete work on the cross of Calvary, right? That he had died for their sins, rose again. And now they're thinking, oh, now I have to go to the law to actually perfect me. And so Paul is writing them and he's saying, hey, listen, you guys are getting this wrong. You can't be perfected by the law when the law was not perfect in itself that Jesus had to come and make the law perfect. So you can't go reverse and think that you're fixing things, right? He's like, uh, Jesus didn't die so you could go back to the law and embrace the law. Jesus didn't uh, complete and fulfill the law and do this new covenant by his blood so you could think that your works is going to save you. Because it's... it's uh, Either Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins, and we believe that, or 
uh, it's nothing else, right? You can't add to, to the gift of grace that we have at salvation. You can't say, okay, well, I have to add my own works to that because then you're saying Jesus' sacrifice was not good enough, right? And that's what he's writing to the Galatians. He's saying, you guys are smacking the face of Jesus. You're saying that your work was not adequate enough. So I have to go back to the law and I have to live the law in my life in order to complete what you couldn't do on the cross of Calvary. And obviously he would be very upset with that, right? And so that's the crux in uh, Galatia. Um, so you see some of the writing that Paul says as he's talking to the Galatians. In Galatians 1 6, he says it right away. He says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And then he fixes it. And right after he says a different gospel, he says, But it's not even a different gospel because there's no good news if you're having to work for your own salvation because you're always going to you know, make a mistake there anyway. Um, so it was something that Paul was very upset about, that somebody else was coming in after he had planted that church and established that church, and they're saying, hey, look, you have to also uh, live the law and work for your salvation. So Paul's very upset about that. So... Paul is letting us know in the book of Galatians that a perverted gospel, meaning a gospel that isn't clear, meaning Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. That's the gospel. It's good news that Jesus did it all for you, and you're completely 100% saved when you believe in him. He's saying it's a perverted gospel is no gospel at all. If you add to the gospel, if you say, guess what, now you have to also be baptized, or now you also have to go back to the works of the law, or you have to, you know, meet on this certain day, or you have to eat this certain food, right? Um, then he's saying you're perverting the gospel, and that's no gospel at all. And some people were preaching a different gospel, salvation through Jesus and the law of Moses. And so Paul is saying, that's not really even a gospel. Because there is only one gospel, which is what Jesus did on the cross for us. And we go to the gospel, the book of Romans. And there's another problem, right? So every book, like I said, that Paul's writing, he's writing to believers, number one. Let's get that straight. And he's encouraging them to make changes in their life. So it's discipleship based, right? And he writes to the book of Romans because there's an issue there, too. What's the issue? Well, the problem in Romans is there's a tension between the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, there's pagan tendencies for the Gentiles, right? They want to go back to their old lifestyle um, while still being Christians. But Paul's saying, hey, listen, what does darkness have to do with light, right? You it's, it's not good for you to keep on going back to your old lifestyle and do those old things and, and cheat people or when you're in the marketplace, right? Or why are you still going to the temple of Zeus when you know that Jesus Christ is the only way? And so those are the things that they're dealing with. He's trying to deal with their culture and shift their culture off of a Roman and Greek culture into the culture of Christ, into the culture of grace, into the culture of love God and love people. And yes, live in this world, but not of this world. And that is still something that Christians deal with heavily today. Um, it's a lack of understanding grace and mercy. And that's why Paul, in his uh, first probably... 10 chapters in the book of Romans dedicates it to explaining grace and mercy so clearly. You know, uh, that's why when uh, so many people love to use the book of Romans uh, to share the gospel, it's not a, uh, it's not a gospel book like the, 
the book of John, right? Who says, hey, look, this book is written, in John 20, 31, so that people in reading might believe. Romans isn't written that way, but because he's explaining grace and mercy, it has so many great verses, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Um, I, there's it's, it's just so rich. There is none who is righteous. No, not even one. Um, so there's... It's rich in grace and mercy teaching because he's trying to clarify to the Romans what grace and mercy is, why we needed salvation, why we needed somebody to die on the cross for us, and why they should now, not because it's a necessity, but because of the love that they have for Jesus back, should now live for him. And that's where you go in Romans chapter 12. The solution to that is the gospel, faith and not works. And again, you see that through the book of Romans. Romans 1, 16, 17 is a prime example for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God, right? It's God's power is revealed through the fact that one person, Jesus Christ, could die on the cross and forgive the sins of of the whole world, and not just the whole world, but those that would come, the past, present, and future sins, and past, present, future people as well. I mean, that is God's power revealed. That is strength, just to think about that. Um, and that's what Paul says in Romans 1, 16, 17. And the gospel shows that both Jews and Gentiles stand equal in need. Um, and and Paul lists that out. He he uses the Jews as the example to the Romans, and and he just spells it out how they failed time and time again, and he's doing that so they don't feel like they're the only ones who have failed. It's not because Paul's trying to beat up on his own people. It's he's giving the example all their failures because even as Christians we fail too. The gospel shows how salvation can be received by both Jew and Gentile, Romans uh, 4 through 8. And the gospel shows God's true will for the Jews um, in Romans 9 through 11. And the gospel shows um, how all of our lives should look in Christ, right? And you come to that beautiful uh, Romans chapter 12, where it's really just talking about us as God's called out assembly, as God's people, doesn't use the word church, but it really just lays out in Romans 12 how the church should operate. Uh, and it starts with us. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, meaning you believers, by the mercy of God, to offer your bodies as a sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. And it just goes into, you know, the weeping with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Associate with the lowly. That's all in just one chapter in Romans. And it's really just laying it out there. How all of our lives should look, and should is a, a relative term, right? It doesn't mean that it's we're going to have this 100%, and it doesn't mean we're going to do it perfectly. Um, but this is what we should want, which is to try to be as Christ-like as we can. And so that's what's taking place in the book of Romans. And then we go to... The church in Corinth. And Paul writes a lot to the church in Corinth. Just to let you guys know, there are actually four letters that we know Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Only two of them are known. We only have two that are actually written down that we have. And we call them 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But in actuality, 1 Corinthians is probably 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians is probably 4 Corinthians that we know of, okay? Um, that doesn't mean that if we found today the other letters to the book of Corinth, they should be in the Bible, right? Because the Bible has been preserved by God 
through the Holy Spirit for us and is profitable for the correction, for the training, and uh, for, you know, the building up in the person of God, right? And so what's been preserved is what we need. And so we shouldn't add it to the scripture. We shouldn't add it to scripture beyond what is already there. Uh, but it would be cool if we did find the other two missing letters to Corinth, the church in Corinth. But Paul wrote a lot to the church in Corinth because they had a lot of problems going on there. Uh, Corinth was a pagan city, a pagan uh, group. Um, they had a lot of issues going on. <clears throat> we see the problems. They had problems of division. We see that in chapters 1 through 4. They had problems with incest. A um, young man was sleeping with his stepmom and was parading it in the church, and the church was actually accepting it. They had problems with lawsuits, and they were suing one another. The, the, the church and church members were going and suing one another for frivolous little issues, and Paul even calls that. He's like, these are worthless issues. Why can't you guys just get along, right? And then there's issues of fornication, where they're just going and sleeping around. They're laying with prostitutes, and they're doing things that they shouldn't, sexual issues. And so that's a lot that has to do with the book of 1 Corinthians. And Paul has to write about that. He talks about the importance of marriage and how the marriage bed should be protected. Uh, because in the church of Corinth, they didn't see that as an important thing, right? They slept with whoever, I guess. Um, but then he says, hey, listen, if you don't have to be married, then don't feel obligated that you should be. And he talks about food that was offered to idols um, and how, listen, really, in actuality, yeah, you could eat food that's offered to idols. But if your brother or sister in Christ has an issue with that, and that's going to make them sin and feel guilty, then don't eat the food offered to idols. Uh, he talks about the woman's role within a church. He talks about the Lord's Supper because they were getting drunk and being gluttons uh, when they were coming to honor the Lord, right, at his supper and remember the Lord's table, right? And that was, the, I love it because even today we still use that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to share communion. And when you really get down to it, why is Paul writing that and saying, hey, listen, when you guys come to the Lord's table, this is how you should approach it. It was because they were getting drunk and they were overeating. And that's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then he writes about spiritual gifts because there was people that had the gift of prophecy and they were bashing people that didn't have that gift. There was people with the gift of tongues and they were saying, hey, listen, if you don't have the gift of tongues, you're not saved. Um, if you don't have the gift of healing, you're not as good as me. And then Paul says, hey, listen, I have all those gifts and more. And the thing that I think is the most important of all the gifts is having the love of God in my life. And if you don't have the love of God, it doesn't matter what gift the spirit of God has given you and empowers you with. That mean, makes you empty. And so that is the most important thing that any person could have because Paul especially writes so much about how the love of God is what holds the church together. And then he talks about the bodily resurrection because one of the issues that was also plaguing the church in Corinth was there was a denial that Jesus had really resurrected from the dead. Um, and so Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he lays it out there. He says, hey, listen, Jesus appeared to the disciples. Then Jesus appeared to the group that was around the disciples. Jesus appeared to me. Okay, so already you have about 20 people that Paul just said. And then he says, and then Jesus appeared to over 500 people. So you have about 520 people that Jesus appeared to resurrected. And he says, and most of those people are still living today. And they can attest to this. 
So he wants people to know that the bodily resurrection of Jesus is a true thing. Because one of the things that people were saying was that Jesus didn't actually physically resurrect, that he spiritually resurrected. And so he wants to make sure that they know that the, this is an important issue. Because if Jesus couldn't resurrect himself, then how could he resurrect us? And that's why he would say, and if we... Uh, if Jesus didn't, didn't resurrect physically, then we are to be pitied um, because Paul wants to make sure that these people know and correct that false view that Jesus didn't, didn't resurrect from the dead. So we have those as just a few of the uh, issues that Paul's dealing with in the church of Corinth. So a quick little overview, you guys see some of the issues that are being dealt with in the Church of Corinth. You can see the chapters that are associated with them. These will be in the um, the video. You guys can see these later on. Uh, this can help you guys uh, in developing the answers to your questions um, for the worksheets as well. So as we move on, here's one more. I, I love using the little examples like this. I think it really just helps us understand this a little bit better. Um, so it's kind of the same problems and sins that we have today, right? Lust, idolatry, fornication, failure to trust God. And that's the same things that we, we uh, deal with. And what's the answer to that? God. Trust the Lord. Go back to his word. Go back to the source, right? Um, and really just try to live as the best representatives of Christ that we can today. Um, and really just go to our source of truth, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and make sure that you are living a life of love. So you come to the book of Philemon, and Philemon is all about the power of grace, right? Because Philemon was a slave that had ran away. And Paul takes a very controversial stance with Philemon by telling him, guess what? You need to go back to your master. Because if your master truly is a believer like you just said he is, then he needs to, on his own account, free you and forgive you. But Paul's saying, hey, look, I'm not going to force him to do this. I'm going to tell him that really, as a person that's been freed by Christ, you should free this brother in Christ. So because you've been freed by the power of Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection from your own sin and death, you should be a person that wants freedom for all other people. So that is really the crux of what Paul is trying to get to when he's writing the book of Philemon. It's all about grace, right? Because Jesus broke your chains, break your brother Philemon's chains, right? Or Onesimus, excuse me. He's writing to Philemon. And so you see these, this uh, is the breakdown of Paul's writing. Uh, he writes his appreciation to him. Uh, he gives Philemon, you know, a greeting and is saying, hey, look, Philemon, I heard you're a great guy, you're a great brother in Christ. But listen, Onesimus is your slave. And he ran away um, because freedom is important. And Christ died to give you freedom. So now you should free your brother Onesimus because he's a brother in Christ. Um, and so really, that's just the entire expression of it. Um, and that's why Paul's writing the book of Philemon. You guys see there's, there's issues. Every book of the Bible has its issue that Paul is really trying to help us um, and the people overcome. Then we come to the book of Philippians. And we see that Paul's purpose in writing to the Philippians um, 
is that he's trying to encourage them towards joy and happiness no matter what is taking place in their life. Because there is always reason to rejoice in the Lord. Right? Christians shouldn't be doom and gloom and, you know, walk around upset constantly. Right? We need to have joy and find reason to celebrate because we have been freed from our sin and death. We have a risen Savior and we have a hope. Right? Um, Sunday came. Right? Jesus resurrected. We have reason to sing. And that's, that's really what he's uh, writing about. Um, he's just really trying to encourage the church in Philippi to celebrate even in the midst of their pain. Um, because the, the church of Philippi was really struggling. And um, so he was trying to encourage them to find joy in their life. Excuse me. Then you come to the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians is all about standing firm against the devil. Um, it gives us how um, wives and husbands should interact. I know that only says wives submitting to their husbands, but it's also talking about the importance of the role of the husband within that. Um, and even the children. Paul mentions the children in that same chapter when he talks about wives. And by the way, just so you guys all know, that word submit in the original language uh, that the Bible was written in, which is Greek, is the word upatasso, and it means to come alongside for the mutual benefit of one another. It was a um, technical term that was used in warfare uh, of like a general leading his troops. The troops submit to their general's knowledge. Why? Because they know that he has their back and he's planning for the best strategic advantage while also trying to give protection to them. And that's really the term that Paul uses of wives and husbands, right? So he's not talking about a woman should ever live as a doormat to a man. Um, and unfortunately, that word submit has taken on an ugly term today. But in Paul's writing, he's talking about the idea of coming alongside one another for the mutual benefit. And he talks about the mystery of the gospel, which is how uh, the mystery of the gospel is how the church is God's bride, is Jesus's bride. And he died to make her something beautiful and sacrificed himself to make her beautiful. And he's saying that's how a husband should look at his wife is as something that he is going to do his best to uh, hold out above all other things and, and just respect and love her. And the elevation of Jesus Christ over all rulers, authorities, and powers in the heavenly realms. So when we come to Ephesians chapter 6, which is also known as the armor of God, it talks about how this armor is a heavenly armor that helps defend um, because it's God's armor. It's not really our armor. It's his armor and we're supposed to use it and uh, that it helps protect us from the heavenly places, right? And um, the only arson thing in our arsenal that we have that is an offensive weapon is prayer. And there's none above Jesus Christ. And so that's what we see in the book of Ephesians. So they were uh, having issues with falling to their temptation. They were having issues when it came to their relationships of husband and wife and the role of husband and wife. Um, they were not really understanding, uh, really why they should be plugged into the church. And so that's why Paul writes about the church and how it's so important and then how really they should not even really respect the outside, re uh, gods because God is the God above all gods. And so that's what we see in the book of Ephesians. 
And so we see a lot of the issues that Paul writes about, writes against. Um, as we said in the book of First the Thessalonians, he's writing a, you know to just clarify how the Lord is coming back again. And he's going to rapture his church. He's going to snatch them away. And then uh, after a time, he's going to come and establish his kingdom. And so, um, like I said before, they thought they missed that. And so Paul is writing them to clarify that. So everything is written in order to um, encourage the people to, to correct the issues that they had. Um, that's where, why a lot of our teachings and what we call doctrine, which is our, um, our teachings of the Bible, it comes from Paul's writings because he's clarifying things for people. A lot of our discipleship will come from Paul's writings because he writes a lot of things to tell people, Hey, guess what? You shouldn't be doing those things and change that about yourself. And so we, we, are encouraged in our own Christian walk through these writings because it helps us look at it and take a self-analysis, look at ourselves and say, hey, you know what? Um, to use as an example, Galatians, right? Uh, I don't have the fruit of the Spirit in my life, Galatians chapter 5. Um, I don't have love, joy, peace, patience, you know, I don't have those things going on in my life very well. So I need to start walking in the spirit, meaning I need to start digging back into the word of God and nurturing and growing the Holy Spirit in my life. Right. So all of that, again, is just to help um, the believers at that time. And through them, us. To avoid pitfalls in our relationship with Christ. Any questions? No, no questions? What do, um, what are some things that uh, kind of stick out to you guys about um, Paul and his way of going about things. Let's just, um, you know, Paul would go into the cities. He would focus on the cities. He would go into the synagogues first uh, because of his background. And then he would go out to the, uh, to the Gentiles and reach them as well. But then he didn't leave them alone, right? Paul would always go ahead and write them again. Um, so, what do you think that kind of points to us in our relationship with people? Somebody want to share? Well, I think he was very uh, humble. Um, he had humility, but he was bold in proclaiming the truth. So he was always speaking the truth, but in love. Yeah, that, that is for sure. Um, you know, we have areas in, in 2 Corinthians, where Paul's like, hey, listen, um, I didn't want to have to do this, but you guys are making me, and I'm going to have to go ahead and let you know, I'm an apostle, and I'm telling you guys that this has to be now. Um, and he's like, and I didn't want to have to say that, but now I am. But So you're right. Yeah, Paul was very humble in, in his approach. Um, he didn't like to throw his weight around, right? Um. But how about this one? Paul, in his approach, right? Uh, he would reach people for Christ. He would set up a church. He would either leave a person that he had trained to be the pastor of that church or the elder of that church. Or he would train an individual uh, to take over. And then he would constantly be writing and visiting the church and the people later on. That kind of lets us know that when we are evangelizing, when we're sharing the gospel with people, that we should care about their growth in Christ as well, which is discipleship. Right? That we shouldn't leave people as babies in Christ. Um, that we should actually take it upon ourselves to... As Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, 18 through 20, 
go make disciples of all the nations. Um, Jesus didn't tell us, go make more Christians, right? Yes, we need to make more Christians. It's important to make more people that know Jesus and know they're going to heaven when they die. But the reason why Jesus said make more disciples is because he wants us to take people under our wing in the faith and grow them. And that's what Paul did. He would go from town to town and he would invest in those people's lives. He took a, a definite interest in how they were developing, right? He cared about, I mean, look at what's written on this PowerPoint right here. He cared about their marriages. He cared about their families. He cared about how they were interacting with even their, their, their slaves. He, he wrote to uh, Philemon on Onesimus' behalf, but it was because he, he's like, this shouldn't be, right? He, he cared about everybody's relationship with each other because that's discipleship. And so I think that is what we need to take from Paul. In fact, he tells us to. In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Right? So he's encouraging us to grow in our own discipleship as he's growing in discipleship and as we're discipling other people. Um. So what are some things that may have stuck out to you guys as we went over some of the issues uh, that Paul was writing about and against that maybe like we opened with, right? We said, uh, what are some of the issues that you guys see within the church today? Do you see some of those within the church? Some of the things that Paul wrote against and about? Do you see those still cycling within the church? Most definitely. Yeah, which one in particular do you think? Well, which one like grabbed you as soon as we read it? The one our preacher talks about the most is that, you know, they have the most amount of people going in to talk about marital problems. And it, it's still one of the biggest problems he says that he sees so much. And, you know, he, every week he kind of like, I always notice it, that he kind of touches on that so much because there's so much divide in the couples yeah. and in the home and children and so forth. So. Yeah. And the Bible talks so much about it. What other ones guys, did you see that, uh, Paul talks about and is still in the church today. It's still is some issues that we have today. Um, what has stood up to me was more of uh, what Paul was doing, that how you were saying that he cared about people learning and knowing the truth. It was like, for me, it's like he was teaching out of love of Christ instead of his high position, his, his knowledge. He was just, he wanted a, other he wanted other people to receive the same love Christ uh, showed him and his disciples um, about the gospel and, and everything that was going around at those times. Oh, was, yeah. Was, yeah, that's a great point, Rochelle. He, um, you know, especially to, again, to the Corinthian church, um, he's like, you know, you guys are getting me upset. And he's like, you know, some of you guys are saying I was baptized by Apollos and I sat under this person's teaching and that person's teaching. And he's like, I am so glad I have not baptized any one of you guys. He's like, because you're making me so upset. And he's like, and and I didn't come to you with eloquent speech, and I didn't force anything on you guys. But, um, man, you guys really got to get this, this right, because this is, you know, um, he just came with love, right? That was his approach. He, he, he told them they were wrong, but he t did it in a way that was, was, was loving and really just, you know, 
coming alongside them. Well, guys, um, I appreciate you guys um, coming in with your input today. I think that uh, really, if we looked and studied each one of the individual books in more in depth, there would be so many areas within our own lives and in the lives of the church that we could look at and say, uh, man, it, it really just feels like Paul is still writing to us right now, because that's really um, what Hebrews calls the Bible is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? Um, because that's exactly what it is. It's uh, just as relevant today as it was when it was written. Um, and it's just for us to go and make sure that we're trying our best to live by it. And that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. And it doesn't mean that we have found the perfect church because it's full of people that are flawed just like us. But what it means is, is that as we read it, we need to be changed by it and grow by it and encourage others to do the same. Do you guys have any uh, prayer requests or questions as we end? Because I would love to pray with each and every one of you. Any prayer requests? Um, if you could just pray for uh, my girlfriend's family, I've been kind of reaching out to them and teaching them about, you know, Christianity and Christ and stuff like that. And they're seeming very interested. Um, and just pray that that continues and it's not, I don't know, doesn't die off. Sure. Okay. Anyone else? No, no other ones. Okay. Well, um, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Luke, what's your girlfriend's? Um, do you have? Well, do you mind sharing her name so we could pray in particular? Uh, Isabella and uh, Rosanna is her mom, okay. and her brother is Sebastian. All right. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, just the opportunity to uh, go into your word, to look at really, um, Lord, we're, we're all just sinners saved by grace. I think that's what we need to take out of uh, the teaching today. Um, and we're still sinning. We're still making mistakes, just like the church uh, way back when was making mistakes. The formation of the church one of the first things that we see is they made mistakes. Um, and Lord, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to better ourselves. But what it means is that we are still people that are in need of grace, love, and mercy. And you still shower it upon us, Lord. And what we need to do is just as we talked about in this class, is to continue to teach the truth in love. That we need to be uh, patient with people. That we need to realize that we make mistakes and still love others, Lord. Lord, we pray for uh, Luke's girlfriend, Lord, Isabella. We pray for her family to come to a knowledge of you, as right now they're seeking. And Lord, uh, what a great time to be seeking uh, as we just celebrated Easter. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would just touch their lives, that you would uh, be w at work in uh, Rosanna, and that you'd be at work in Sebastian, that you would help them to just come to the knowledge of salvation in Jesus Christ, Lord. That you would help them to see that there is no other way uh, to be in heaven. That there is no other way to have freedom from sin and death, Lord. From the mistakes that we make in life without Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that you would help them to see that. And Lord, uh, use Luke to do that. Or Lord, if it's going to be one of Luke's friends or, or somebody, Lord, or... If he's just there to plant the seed, Lord, I, I pray that uh, it would be planted and that, uh, Lord, that it would be something that takes place soon. We pray this in Jesus' precious and most holy name. Amen.